Hello and welcome to the Spatial Structures Movers and Shakers interview series as we look ahead to the ISS Annual Symposium and Spatial Structures Conference taking place at the University of Surrey in August 2021. My name is Mark Richardson and today I'm joined by Jaime Sanchez who is a senior geometry designer at Lindner Steel and Glass. Jaime is a member of the scientific committee for the 2021 conference and an alumnus of the University of Surrey where the conference is being held. Jaime, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. Thank you, Mark. I'm very happy to be with you. And first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation. No problem. It's our, our pleasure, absolute pleasure to have you on the interview series. Um, we tend to start the interviews by asking, how have you uh, found the lockdown period that we've been in over the, the last few months? Oh, very long, very tedious. <laughs> but I think it, was, it has been a necessary measure to try to control this virus spread. I personally started at the middle of March, working at home with my own computer. But at the beginning of April and throughout May, the company had already organized the official home office um, work, work for most of the people in the company. Um, one day I had to collect all my computer equipment from the company with a mask and I had to install it home, but they implemented it very well. So that's it. everybody having this uh, software installed at home could uh, log in in the company network and we could also um, communicate and we had access to all the uh, files and the projects that we needed. Uh, we need. And we also were able to communicate with the uh, chat sort of messenger systems and video conferences on per telephone. It was a process of learning. Many of us have been in this situation at all. No? So it was really a challenge to keep on performing uh, work and working as part of a team. No? It was difficult because you are as isolated in the room and you, it's difficult to get the human uh, mm -hmm. reaction to what you are saying. Yeah? But it was a very, very interesting also situation. No? Uh, that gave us also the chance to try this telework, this other way of working together. I think it's many people in many countries are exercising this kind of telework nowadays. No? And you learn to, to appreciate the, the importance of uh, interpersonal communication via the modern ways or means of communication. No? Yes, it's uh, been a very, a very surreal time, but that's, um, uh, it sounds like your company's been very organized and um, yeah, as you say, people have been uh, approaching it in, in different ways using different technologies. Um, mm -hmm. We're also asking our guests on the series about their career journey. Um, maybe you could provide us with a overview of your own career journey to date. Okay, well, uh, I was born in Mexico City and I studied architecture from 1971 to 76, more or less, at the National University of Mexico. And more or less at the middle of my career, every architecture student can do that. You can pick up optional subjects so you can orient in the direction you like no, or you are interested in. So I started picking up uh, subjects like geometry, advanced geometry, also materials, and of course, structures. And during this orientation, I also came to meet uh, Professor Jose Mirafuentes. Uh, Professor Jose Mirafuentes had been doing research at Fry Otto Institute in Stuttgart in the 60s for several years. And he attended also the first international conference on space structures in Surrey in 1966. And he brought back the proceedings at that time, of course, you know, there, there were no internet yeah. and not access to this information. No? So that was really, I, I managed also to get, be, to get to be his assistant for a couple of years. So one of my jobs was to translate about 20, 25 papers of these proceedings into Spanish. So that was a very good chance to uh, get to know the subject in a very, very uh, high detail. No? Yeah. And that's why I oriented me. Ah, oh, yes. And that, that's how I got to, to know the Space Structural Research, Research Center. No? I think in 1977, I got a, a scholarship from the British Council and the University of Mexico 
to learn much more about space, space structures at, uh, at Miguel Fortin. And I was very lucky to get uh, Professor Nushin as supervisor. That was very, I was ultra happy because I got the scholarship for the Space Structure Center and later more, much more happier to have got Dr. Nushin as a supervisor. Uh, when I started in 1977, there were the early days so when Dr. Nushin was laying out these beautiful concepts of his former algebra and he needed someone from the architectural side to check and to try and to work with his abstract formulations. No? So we were working very closely. Dr. Nushin is a brilliant person. No? He really likes or the develops fundamental things that has very, very uh, large or far going consequences. No? And the applications of his algebra are very beautiful. No? Uh, working with Dr. Nushin, well, he opened to me like in a quantum leap, a new way of looking at complex system and complex configurations no? from the numerical and algebraic point of view. No? But he was also very demanding. No? He was also, he was developing his concepts and his functions and I had to try to formulate with his functions all kinds of configurations. And he was very keen on me advancing at his, uh, at his pace. No? I remember we had sessions Every once, every week, once a week, a fixed session for three years, every week, ex except on holidays, of course. No? And he wanted to know what I have done in the week. When I didn't have anything, I said, Dr. Nushin, uh, I did, this week I cannot show you anything I have done. So what did, what did you do in the week? Well, I was thinking about some ideas. Well, tell me your thoughts. We discuss your thoughts. No? <laughs> But he, he was very fair and really brilliant and he is a person who would motivate you to be interested in your work and to carry on and really put all your energy into that project. No? So I was very, very happy to have him as a, as a teacher, as a lecturer, as a supervisor. No? He's a great brain, he's a great mind and also a great person. No? That's, that's, that's wonderful. A, a fantastic summary of your, of your time with uh... Professor Nushin and uh, your time at the University of Surrey as a as a PhD student. And um, what about your career after that, Jaime? What did you go on to uh, to do with your career after Surrey? After Surrey, in the last month of my stay at Surrey, uh, Professor Markovsky had organized a small conference on space structures, and he invited people from the academic world and also from industry and people from the Merrill company. Perhaps you know Merrill is one of the pioneer companies in the design and construction of space structures. Well, the manager was there and then at that time they, they wanted to go and open a Merrill Mexico. So he was delighted to meet a Mexican who is just finishing, who was just finishing, who had a German wife. And so they didn't let me go. So I still had to go one year to Mexico, but they offered me a job. And one year later, I was back and starting in Germany. That was, I think, October 1981. And I started at the Research and Development Department on the Dr. Klimke. And that was a very good chance to know all the uh, basic theory behind the Merrill systems, behind the design analysis and construction of these systems, and also to learn how to use the tools. No? There were many open pro development projects that so I, I could take part in several of them, especially in those concerned with geometry development. And later on, uh, once we had developed some tools, of course the management was interested that we apply them on real projects, so we immediately uh, we're using these new tools uh, for making offers, alternatives of, for projects, and also later I had the opportunity to work on real projects, doing the modeling or, or geometric, and geometric design for these projects. Huh? Uh, Mero had a very, very good name many, many decades, so many architects went that was the first address they went to when they wanted to do a spatial structure. No? So that's why I, we had a very good relationship to, to, with very renewed, or very famous architects and also structural designers. There were many combinations of famous architects 
famous structural designers and Meron to be able to materialize an abstract design into a real object. So we had many, many interesting projects that are known all, all through the world. In the middle part of the interview, I will comment on some of these projects. That's great. Thank you, Jaime. And um, speaking of your, your portfolio, it's um, uh, very impressive. It's filled with some very iconic buildings from all around the world. So, I mean, examples include the Eden Project in the UK, the Ferrari Experience in Abu Dhabi, and the new uh, Milan Trade Fair in Italy. Um, maybe you can tell us which of these particular projects have you enjoyed working on the most and why? Oh, I think I like every one of it. <laughs> Because um, every project, what, especially these iconic projects, they come from renowned architects. Their quality of design is very good. So every one of these projects br brought new problems to us and gave us all the chance to apply our the mirror technology to try to solve their structural and constructional requirements. So it was really a pleasure to be able to take part in each, and in, in every one of these projects. No? Uh, what I perhaps regret a little bit that there were sometimes overlappings with interesting projects, so you have to switch from one project to the other. No? But otherwise, every project was, was uh, an opportunity also to develop further in the design of this kind of complex structures. No? Yeah, no, it sounds absolutely amazing. And uh, as you say, quite an opportunity to work across um, such a diverse and interesting range of, uh, of, of structural projects. Um, so, but thanks very much for that, Jaime. It's now time to move to the middle section of the interview, which um, is entitled Your Space, Your Structure. So I'm going to hand over the presentation to Jaime, who is going to take us through a short presentation on a spatial structures topic of personal interest to him. Um, so over to you, Jaime. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, uh, um, one of the key words in this uh, um, coming conference on space, spatial structures is uh, inspiring the next generation. No? And I will show you to, for the start a couple of very early inspirations I had without knowing it that I was going to work in this area. No? You see the date of this uh, slide is about 1957. I must have been about six years old. And this church, it was designed by Felix Candela. And my, that's very close to the place I lived about 24 <coughs> 24 years of my life and I remember my mother used to take me to this church about every Sunday so I had the chance to look at this uh, church very quickly from the inside for about five to six years and I was enchanted by this, uh, this splendid design of Felix Candela. Some 10 years later I came across this book at the top on the right hand side, that's the, the Wizard of the Dawn, that's the Spanish version of a book about uh, <coughs> uh, geodesic tombs of uh, Buckminster Fuller. And uh, that's when I decided I, ha I want to do this, I want to work on this area, no? more or less at the same time that this uh, beautiful dome at down on the left, designed by Felix Candela, Castañeda and Perry for the Olympic Games in Mexico, also was a very clean and splendid example of a very advanced type of structures. That was a grillage of circular, double cord circular arches, and in between the infields were realized in this Castaño triadetic um, single layer reticulated hip high parts. No? And that's what decided my way into the architecture and design of these structures. No? I was very interested in geometry and shapes. I also wanted to learn about the engineering of it, but geometry is what pulled me to this, into art, into the field of architecture. No? And that's what I would, I would like to focus uh, in this middle part of the interview in the geometry behind the spatial structures. And uh, being a geometry designer, I would almost say spatial structures are equal to geometry. Of course, I know this is an oversimplification. And some engineers would say, what about structural analysis? What about materials and some other things? No? But I think one of the uh, cores or the basis of any spatial structure is geometry. No? I will go through the small or the short review of geometry or the geometry of spatial structures. 
let's you here we have regular spec structures and many of these regular spec regular spec structures they have very simple normative principles or principles of growing for instance Mero based some of his uh, norm space structures on this geometric series based on the square root of two you know? because that gave a lot of regularity and a lot of combinations having a minimum um, number of components you know? The picture at the bottom shows the pedestrian bridge built at the beginning of the 40s, built with norm components. And from that time and for the next 80 years, many people have been building space structures with these norm components. By the 80s, 1980s, this is the collection of components of the Mero system. There were very small nodes and also very big nodes, very small bars, very large sections. So you could combine it to design and generate small structures, middle-sized structures, and large structures. If you connect these elements, they look like that. Many people are familiar with this type <laughs> of connection of space structures. Mero is the archetypical space structure system. For many years, there were many copies or clones of this system all around the world. The spherical load and the round tube. With this, the, one characteristic of these regular space structures is that, that the angles at the nodes are fixed angles, are fixed values, so they can be produced in series and you can uh, build and design many types of configurations. And that was done through the 60s, the 70s, and by the 80s, well, the uh, structures also started to get more complex configuration, more interesting from the morphological point of view. And many people were designing around the world with this uh, component of regular space structures. No? Uh, also, spans keep, kept on growing. By the 80s, we, we were building, or Mero was building spans as a standard um, subject of 100 meters. And also the combinations of plate-like space structures like this National Theater in Kuala Lumpur were done with regular space structures. Even looking into the future, populating 3D space with uh, just a few components uh, offers you an infinite possibilities of building interesting space configurations. This is an exercise we, we did in connection with Professor Michael Bird of the Technion in Haifa. He started his research in, in the 60s. And we also tried to apply his ideas for real structures. No? In this case, we were taking, we are taking a slice of this infinite polyhedral lattice, see a six layer system and make a comparison with a conventional steel stress system. No? And from the difference in weights here, 102 and 168, yes, only 68 kilograms per square meters, by a span of almost 300 meters, you see uh, it's about 30% savings with this ultralight space structure configurations. No? And this is a very regular system. No? And uh, summarizing no? the space, regular space structures, the more regular, the better. No? The target has been to obtain the minimum number of line lengths on, of node types, the angle combinations at the nodes on panel types. No? On the left-hand side, you see here some well-known space structures configurations. In the top row, in the middle, you see the square on offset, offset squares, two-layer grid. And I mention this because I think more than 80% of the space structures, the regular space structures in the world, have been built with this geometry. Later, you will see why. But if you want to map or build space structures on curved surfaces, in this case, the cylinder, the first thing you have to do is to liberate the node from the fixed drilling angles at the nodes, no? so, you, so that you can adapt a topological network to any kind of surface. No? By the end of the 70s, Mero was so far that it had already automated greatly its production and technical processing. No? We were going parametric already. No? We were doing automatic dimension of tubes and nodes including the interference check, the parts list generation, the generation of data sets for NC machining and drilling, and automatic generation assembly drawings. 
and by the middle, and this is a breakthrough project. Then this split stadium from 1979 with 230 meters span. No? And by the middle of the 80s, uh, this kind of large structures, complex structures, uh, as this hyper down on the right from Felix Candela, uh, they were a matter of routine for Mero for the spherical load and round tube system. No? With almost this system, we Mero built a lot of domes. One of the outstanding domes, you know it in the UK very well, is the Eden Project in Cornwall. Cornwall uh, at about that was a millennium project, no? And as you can see on the top picture, it consists of two sets of four interconnected geodesic domes. No? In this project, it was the first time that the hex three hex grid was applied on an geocosahedral system. No? The architect had designed the envelope of these domes with hexagonal networks. But after a feasibility study, we found out together with uh, Anthony Hunt, the structural engineer, that the more efficient way of building these huge domes was a double layer system. And we found a geometry which ha that has this hexagonal grid on the surface and a, a semi-regular bottom core layer of triangles and hexagons to stabilize the whole system. You see the largest dome is very large, it's 120 meters in diameter. The largest uh, hexagonal cushion has 70 square meters. That's like a dwelling almost. No? Also new requirements require also sometimes new nodes, like that one here on the, on the bottom left, and this provides more stiffness to the connection. No? Up to here, Mero had designed a lot of structures on spherical surfaces, but most of them were analytical surfaces. But at these times, also the uh, architects were designing free-form surfaces. No? And of course, the um, current free-form design, it, it welcomes the rationalization approach of minimizing node lines and mesh types. And this is a feature which is actually nice to have, but it's not essential nowadays due to the, all the advances done in digitalization of the design and the production. But it's nice to have if you have just a few components. Current freeform designs in, aims more at satisfying formal intentions, interesting forms, formal expression, and eventually also satisfy structural and architectural requirements. The next project is the Esplanade Freeform Halls for the Art Center in Singapore. That was the first very large project on freeform, the freeform project for Merrill. No? And we were also trying to keep on with the technology and trying also to make the systems more elegant. In this case, uh, here above on the right hand side, you see that a view from the internal foyer. And here, what the company needs to integrate the structure, the two layer space frame, with the glazing and the al aluminum sun shades in one integral system for roofing them. Down on the left, you see the finished product. By the way, the length of, the, of these holes are about 100, 120 meters, 60 meter wide and 25 high. Top on the left, you see the, our raw material. That's what the architects and the engineers gave us to develop the two layers, uh, the two layer structural grid. At that time, we, also, we were also systematizing all possible features. The systems were getting more and more complex and larger. So we, for instance, in this case, we generated the whole on the um, bottom core and the diagonals with a program in, based on the duali duality principle. Hmm? On the right hand side, you will see a mock-up of the resulting geometry. Hmm? The, Basic grid had a constant length of 1.5 meters and a structural length of 19 centimeters. In this area, or a stage of development of tools development, that was about the year 2000, we also started to extend the geometry model with all other attributes, like in this case, for instance, point colors and point symbols. In this way, we could group the Top the, the nodes of the surface of, the, of these holes 
and create this patchwork. This patchwork is a map of the uh, pressure coefficients of winds to, uh, for a certain wind direction. And with this approach, we could um, mm, implement the automatic generation of, on wind loads for all for these two hulls for 12 wind directions for every node. And that's in an automatic way that fed the, the structural analysis program. And from the construction point of view, also around this year 2000, we started to use normal vectors and grid nodes, normal to the current surface, no? and normal vectors at the middle of the lines with the purpose of positioning and orienting the construction, construction components. No? Uh, in, in particular, normal vectors at nodes were used to make offsets of the nodes to create the subsistence of the complete roofing system. No? The top cord was offset to generate the glazing grid and with a further uh, offset, the secondary grid for the uh, sunshade substructure was generated. <laughs> Nowadays, I think these are some sort of standard features to um, design and construct uh, these freeform space structures. <laughs> All the designers were going in another way. Here, Maximiliano Fuxas, year 2004, uh, developed this free form, very long, 1.3 kilometers, which for construction reasons had to be divided in 12 segments of about 80 to 100 meters. The width varying from 40 to 30 meters and the height from zero to 16 to 25 meters. And almost half of the surface of this front surface is flat. So we had to re-engineer these flat surfaces to obtain, uh, to, to get, um, low high pass and the drainage was done at the low, low, low points of this um, low high pass. Also, these flat areas require bending sti stiffness. And the sections has to be high, so Mero developed this double load to cope with this structural requirement. All our architects were looking at the limits, how far or how big can a space structure be? And Binoy de, de designed this e extraordinary large envelope for a, a leisure park in Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. Up, the virtual image of the architect, and down, the materialized roof. Mm -hmm. 100 meters, the hole in the middle, 650 meters, the distance between the Two, two corners of this roof. No? We were always reaching the limits of many programs. Many programs had to be extended to cope with this huge amount of information to be able to do the structural anal analysis and also to implement the construction. Even renderings, we had a rendering like here. Well, it required many hours to be calculated. No? There are some numbers, we'll, we'll skip them. No? I just want to show that the roof has 200,000 square meters of roof surface, more than 32,000 spherical nodes, and more than 125,000 round tubes. That is, and the whole process of design up to the last state of construction took only one and a half years. One aspect that we hear nowadays concerning Freeform, freeforms is the optimization of networks. But is it possible? Well, I make an oversimplification again. No, if the structure is going to be built, especially if you have a very strong interaction with all our architectural elements, like in the case of this splendid design by Saha Hadid. No? Um, one important requirement of this design was how the paths of the cladding seams outside and inside running parallel to a certain direction no? to suggest the flu movement and smoothness. No? But how do you support these skins? There was, of course, a period of evaluating structural systems, and at the end, the space structural system, especially this geometry square and offset square in combination with this. Uh, spherical node and tubular system uh, won this competition. It was because this geometry with this type of connection allows you to approximate all, almost any ge geometric shape. We have an initial length optimization. I won't go into the details because we couldn't apply it 
to the whole surface because the structural grid of the columns inside, they had another module and they divided the, the surface into patches. So we could only apply our optimization strategy, strategy within these smaller patches, but we, it was a little bit of more work. No? Also the variable distance between external and internal skins and the strong curvature variations didn't allow us to minimize the types of nodes. No? It was really impossible. No? The interaction with building volumes like supports pre positions on in the top uh, in the lower core they force you to um, come with your polylines also going through these fixed points also interaction with other structural systems we were happy that we could weave into in between these supports to be able to guarantee the support for the cladding also the transition to conventional construction with when the space frame system couldn't be applied anymore. Also like in this part of the museum where this point at the bottom is supposed to touch the floor tangentially. But this is a very massive tangential point because it's a support point where a very heavy uh, earthquake loads had to be taken also wind loads. So there was a certain little contradiction with the architectural design. In the end, we had a complete model of this splendid design, and that was the basis for the structural analysis, the construction detailing, and planning the erection of it. And you see, it worked because this is a photograph of the real space structure. Summarizing Baku is a concealed, supporting, and form giving free form space structure. Why do I say that? Because when you apply the cladding, you, you don't see the structure anymore at all. Anybody who doesn't know anything about structures and comes, he has not a clue of how these skins are supported. It's another way of using space structures as form-giving systems and as supporting invisible skeletons. We had to keep also developing with a design trend, so we also engage in gener generative algorithmic and parametric modeling and this is a small example of a facade for the building co of the oil company in Norway in Oslo and this is um, a grasshopper script for the people who work with this thing. that's uh, an addition to Rhino which is a program for modeling and designing free forms in this case you only give four points in the model space and the subdivision numbers in the two di directions, and it delivers you this structure. Mm -hmm. We extended this uh, grasshopper formulation to generate the sections oriented properly to the surface. And so in the form finding stage, we could generate very quickly how the structure could be seen. But in the end, this is the resulting structure. And here one word about geometry right rationalization. The initial surface of the facades were uh, minimal surfaces, but the panels were not flat. And it, the architect wanted to cover it with flat panels of glass. No? So we were lucky. So we compared this minimal surface with a translation surface generated as a, a, a hyper generated as a translation surface. It was very, very close to the, to the original design. So we replaced it and in the end we got glass panels which are completely planar. And my last example here is, is the Kazakhstan Pavilion for the Expo 2017 in Astana. That's a sphere of 80 meters in diameter with spherically curved glazing. This is the geometry, def the geometry definition from the architect. He took a sinusoidal, sinusoidal meridian and it rotated it to 80 times about the sphere vertical axis to generate the glazing grid. And that was the definition. But for construction and economic purposes and fabricational purposes, we had to write, rationalize or simplify this geometry for production. What we did, we took the 
divide the divide the freeform meridian segments more or less every nine meters at every floor. We took the two end points of a segment at the middle point, and with this we define a, an arc, a circular segment. The, the great advantage of this is that the secondary structure is built with round tubes which are bended, and it's much easier to bend a plain, a plain line with a constant circle on, on a plane, precisely. We play a little bit around with the form, and from the center, perpendicular to the base of the cylinder, we extended the line and we met the sphere center. And we proved that, we tested that for the other segments and all the uh, cones axis landed in the center of sphere. And that had a very nice consequence. All these conical segments, which are neighbors, they have a tangential condition at the common line no? in between them. And the consequence for the constructions, when you have a multi-layer system of glass and secondary structures and fixings, is that every edge of this section, when it goes from cone to cone, there's no jump in between. All these lines go continuously from bottom to top with no torsion and jumps or twists. And that was a great gain, a great simplification for the construction. This is a um, rationalized meridian and also the basic segment for the secondary structure and the glazing. This is the end product, spherical or spherically curved glass. No? Special structures equal geometry, okay. So I'm back again. Jaime, mean, thank you very much for taking us through that. It was a whistle-stop tour of um, a huge number of uh, very interesting and diverse uh, range of spatial structures. Uh, fascinating stuff. Um, and thank you for showing us all. There's so, so many things to learn. Um, we're also exploring in the series the 2021 conference. And um, as I think we briefly alluded to, earlier, the aim of the, or theme of the ISS 2021 conference is about inspiring the next generation. Um, how do you think this aim can be best achieved in the field of spatial structures? Well, I can tell you my point of view from the, the perspective of a geometry designer. Uh, I think, uh, especially working with famous architects and engineers, uh, one of the things what we had to do was to work as intensively as possible. You have to identify with the object that you are working on and you have to be able to communicate with all the them, team members. No? In this way, you advance like a team. And I think that's a kind of a, a self-accelerating way of doing things, no? trying to achieve the best result as, as, a, as a team of people who are very engaged in having this splendid result. In the end, the design has to satisfy the functional and the architectural requirements. And it's a, um, if you are lucky, if you fulfill the, all these architectural requirements, you also um, achieve to produce a very aesthetical result. I think that at the end, that's very inspiring. When you produce an object that others looked at it and they said, ah, that's a job well done. It works and it also looks very good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, couldn't agree more, Jaime. And um, as we've seen from your presentation, you have more than 40 years experience of working uh, on geometry design, modeling, optimization and rationalization. Uh, Utilising your experience, what would you expect to see as hot topics at the 2021 conference? I think um, the current topics one of them, are, of course, has to do with uh, configuration processing, no? parametric and algorithmic um, design, and de uh, has, uh, is going to still going to develop more. No? And I think there are going to be a very good numbers of this, uh, these topics, no? modeling and designing and analysis, also refining the, the tools that are already, have already been developed, no? but there are very, very interesting um, topics concerning the optimization of these tools 
one of the topics I have seen in some other conference papers is the application of robots also in the design um, and production, in design to production. I think these things will be, be will be one of the major topics in this conference. But I think one very important aspect will be also be the sustainability and the environment, environmental impact of our space structures design because it has to do with uh, what's going on uh, in the planet, in our planet. If we design good structures, structures that uh, fill their purpose, that satisfies the need of people, and that also have a very low negative impact in the environment, that, that's one of the, the important aspects that will be discussed, I think, and I hope they will be discussed in this conference. Yeah, thank you, Jaime. And that's been reiterated by some of our other guests on the series, sustainability and robotics being, uh, being key things that uh, people are looking forward to discussing at uh, the 2021 conference. Jaime, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the um, Spatial Structures interview series today. Um, your presentation was fantastic, uh, quite a, a, an eclectic mix of, uh, of things you've worked on in a, in a very inspiring career. Thank you very much for your time today and um, hopefully we can catch up with you again on the uh, Movers and Shakers series as we move closer to the ISS 2021 conference. But uh, for now, thank you very much, Jaime. Uh, be very welcome, Mark, and thank you again for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to show this interesting thing. That was also very inspiring for me. <laughs> no problem, it was our pleasure. See you again soon. Bye-bye.